Hi and welcome back to the second lecture on CCNA2 routing and switching essentials with me, Joachim Kjøvrestad from the University of Skjøvde. Uh, the topic of today is static routing and remember that the teaching method that we're trying to employ uh, includes you pausing, doing, end of chapter uh, or end of section sort of quizzes within the Cisco material and doing the practicals, not just watching. Uh, and uh, passively listening. You should actually work with the theory to try to learn it. So we're continuing on with the routing concepts and what we're going to do in this lecture is that we're going to look uh, in more detail on static routing and we're going to show what it is, why you should have it and when you should use it. We're going to look on some different types of static routes and then we're going to look on how we can configure, verify and troubleshoot static routes. So um, a little bit repetitive from the last lecture, but question is why do we need routes? And well, you should know that routers are aware of connected networks, but has to learn about remote networks. And those can be learned either dynamically using routing protocols or manually using static routes. So if we look in the uh, if we look in the picture here, you can see that router one being down here. Uh, is aware of this network, this network, and this link network here, but it doesn't have any idea at all about the networks on this side. So it's not aware of the internet, it's not aware of the PC3 network or the PC4 network. Uh, so we, it has to learn about those networks and it has to learn about those either using dynamic, uh, dynamic routing protocols that we're going to look on in the next lecture and in CCNA3 or by configuring manual static routes to each and every one of those networks. So let's just have a little look on pros and cons with the uh, static and dynamic routing. So there are some differences. and when we should know that static routing isn't just uh, some bullshit that we're doing as some teaching ex exercise, it has some drawbacks. Uh, but if we look at configuration complexity, you should know that dynamic routing, that's generally independent of the network size. And that is because you configure routers to share information and learn automatically. Uh, however, with static routing, you should know that the complexity of configuration increases with network size. So if there is just a small network with a couple of routes, then configuring them manually is not a problem. But if you have a network with 100 routers, then it's going to be a lot of networks that has to be consistently configured across each router. Uh, looking at topology changes, like when a router is added, when something goes up and down, uh, dynamic routing protocols has the ability to automatically adapt to those changes, while aesthetic routes will remain and the administra uh, administrator has to intervene and do manual reconfiguration. Uh, on the scaling aspect, dynamic routing protocols are uh, suitable for both simple and complex topologies because they have this ability to, uh, to learn uh, and automatically adapt to topology changes, whereas static routing is more suitable for simple topologies. Uh, on the security side, there are some security issues in dynamic routing that makes it less secure, while static routing is more secure, and we're going to discuss why dynamic routing can have some security issues later on. Uh, on, on the resource usage, well, all this automa automagic stuff has, will uh, consume some CPU memory and bandwidth, so there is some resource usage to take into consideration with dynamic routing, while as for static routing, there is just configure and go, no extra resources needed. Uh, looking at the predictability, you want to know how, uh, what way data is taken through the network, and with dynamic routing, um, the predictability will depend on the current topology, and packages may take different routes, whereas for static routing, the route to destination network is always the same. So looking at a perfect example of when to use a, a static network is when we have what is called a stub network. And a stub network is when we have a router that is connected to one internal network, like this one here, and it only has one connection to one external network, like this one here. So what this network needs to know about is that it has this internal network right here and whenever it's going to send something from this network, it's going to send it out this interface. So we call this a stub network and we, uh, or this is stub router and we call this a stub network because it's a 
uh, well, what would you say, an end. There is no continuation in this area. There is only one network to care about and so on and so forth. And this is a perfect example of what we could use static routing. Because in this scenario, router two would be configured with a static route to the network down here. And router one would be configured with a static default route saying that whenever it's not for my network, then just send it out this way. So moving on. Uh, static routes are used to connect to a specific network, saying specifically that package going to this network out in distance should take this way. Connecting a stub network and a stub network, you can also use it to summarize routing table entries, which we're going to look on a look at in a little while, or create backup routes, which we're also going to explore in a little while. There are different types of static routes. We're going to take go through them in in the next couple of slides, it's standard default summary and floating. And then you say, what are those? Well, starting with standard and default, a standard route, a static route is a route that simply points out a remote network. So if you say, take this way to that network, then that's a standard static route. We also have the default static route, that is a route that will match any IP package and can be used to configure a catch-all route for packets with unknown destination addresses. And this is what creates a gateway of last resort, as we saw in the last lecture, and you can compare this to a default gateway. Um, then moving on to the summary static route, and a summary static route is when you have when you, when you express one single route that uh, that contains multiple networks. So looking at the example here, you can see that within this area, there are a couple of networks that are beginning with 172. Uh, they are called 172 and then 21 uh, or 20, 21, 22 and 23. So actually you can combine those because if you're looking from the point of view of router one, it's going to take the same path to any of those networks, right? Package to any of those four networks is going to be sent out this direction. And what it can do is that instead of configuring four routes, you can configure one single route saying that, well, these network are 172, 20, 21, 22, and 23 that slash 16 respectively with the network ba address boundary going here. So this is the network portion of the, uh, of the IP address, right? But if you just move the network boundary a little bit and do a slash 14 mask, then you can say 172.20.00 slash 14, and that will include, include all of those four networks, meaning that when you're configuring a static route on router one, you can configure one single static route that will cover all of those four networks, and that makes, uh, makes for a little bit shorter routing table. So finally, we have the floating static route and the floating static route is a route that is used as a backup route and it's configured exactly as a standard route, but with a higher administrative distance, the AD. And remember that the AD represents the trustworthiness of a route. So if we have a, uh, a primary path with an administrative distance of, let's say, 90, then we can do a backup path if we just statically configure the administrative distance to be 100 then that's not going to be used unless there uh, unless the first one fails because it's not seen as trustworthy and that way we can get a backup route and that is what is called a floating static route so how do we configure those routes well static routes are configured using the command ip route destination network address netmask and then next hop ip uh, and or exit interface uh, so we're going to, there are some cases where you want to do the next top IP, uh, there are some cases where you want to specify the exit interface, and there are some cases where you want to specify both. And we're going to look at that in the, uh, after we do a little practical. To configure the administrative distance, you add distance key, the distance keyword and the AD that you want. So next top IP will specify the next top IP. Directly connected routes that, that, that is what you call a static route where you specify the exit interface, but you can also do a fully specified route, and that will specify both the exit interface and the next top IP address. And the thing here is that the routing process will be quicker if you specify the exit interface. However, in some cases, you may have a router that is connected to many different routers over a switch, and then specifying the exit interface is going to be a trouble because 
then the well, then the network won't know who is the recipient of the package. And so if you specify the next top IP address, you get you get over that obstacle, but then you won't get the extra speed when it's possible. So then an alternative is to specify both and do a full specified route. So let's do a practical where we configure some static static routes for IPv4 and IPv6 before we go look at the routing table in more detail. So we have our uh, we have our packet tracer assignment here, and what we're essentially gonna do is that I decided to do an IPv6 configuration demonstration, and what you can do is go do the IPv4 version on your own for practice and training. Uh, so what we're going to do is that we're going to begin with going through all the three routers. You see here, in this case, we're going to go all, over all the three routers and see what networks that we have to specify. So if we're beginning with router 1, it will be aware of the link network here with router 2, with this network address, can't move, and it's going to be aware of the PC1 network. Likewise, router 2 will know about the PC2 network and both of those link networks. And router 3 will know about this network and this network here. So if router 3 is going to be able to forward package to packages destined for PC1, it has to learn about that network. And it's also going to have to learn about the networks on the way there. And it's going to do this, in this case, with static routes. However, uh, with, since when we're doing IPv6 stuff, what we have to do first is to enable IPv6 on each and every one of the router. So remember that IPv6 is disabled by default, so what we have to do is go to enable, configuration terminal, and then we use the command IPv6 unicast routing, and that enables IPv6 routing on the router. So router 1, router 2, again we do enable, Conf T for configuration terminal and IPv6 unicast routing. And the same for router 3. A lot of clicking around. So now that's done, we can start with router 1. And in this case, we have a perfect example of a stub network, right? Because And this is a stub network because there is only one network behind router 1 and there is only one path from that network to the rest of the world. So the easiest way to configure router 1 would be to do a static default route pointing to router 2. So we're going to do a static default route by specifying the exit interface, which is serial 0, 0, 0. So what we do is that we go into the router and we use the command IPv6 route. Then you can do a question mark to see how you're going to specify stuff. And what we want to specify here is the destination network. But when we do a default route, we configure the catch-all network, which in IPv6 is colon colon slash zero. Do the question mark again, and you can see that what we can have uh, then is either an exit interface or the IPv6 address of the next hop. In this case, we decided to go with the exit interface, so we have serial, zero, 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 and that is done. Verify is what we do by doing IPv uh, by doing show IPv6 route to display the IPv6 routing table. Since we're in global configuration mode, we have to put a do in front. And here you can see that we have the static default route. It's denoted by an S, so you know that it's statical. You have the administrative distance being 1, and you have the metric being 0, and it's going to go uh, via serial 000. zero, zero. Uh, so you can see here that there is no gateway of last resort statement for IPv6, and that's the way of things. So let's look towards router 3. And actually, router 3, here we have the same scenario where we have a stub network. So again, we can do a uh, default static route. So what we do is that we will do that, but in this case we're going to do a fully qualified static route. So remember that a fully qualified static route is when we specify the next top IP address and the exit interface. So what we want to do is that we start by typing IPv6 route, IPv6 route, and then we do colon colon slash zero to specify a default static route, and then we begin with typing out the exit interface, which we have to hover over the little ball here to see, serial 001, 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 serial 001
serial zero zero one and then we also if we take the question mark here you can see that we can specify the administrative distance if we want to specify that, that that is what we would do if we were to do a flowing route but in this case we're going to uh, specify the ipv6 address of the next hop so then we have router 2 serial 001 looking in the table serial 001 the ip address of that is 2001 colon db8 colon 1 colon a002 colon colon 1 Remember that zero uh, and slash 64 to specify the subnet mask. S remember that when typing IPv6 addresses, leading zeros in one, each of these groups can be removed. So the actual IP address would actually be 2001 0db8 001 and so on and so forth. And if we have a consecutive set of zeros and we want to zero them all out, we can do um, a double colon. So I'm just hitting enter for now. Um, uh, okay. Maybe it doesn't want the ending mask. No, it doesn't. So configuration error on my side. So that is a fully qualified IPv6 static route for you. And now before we move on, we have to do router two. In the router two case, we have to specify out this network and this network. So now we're going to do normal static routes. So what we're gonna do is that we're going to do normal static routes using exit interfaces. So first examining this network down here, it's going to take this path, right? Serial 000. So what we do is that we do IPv6 route and then the network address to the network that we wanna reach, which in this case will be the PC1 network, so it's 2001 colon db8 colon 1 colon 1 colon colon slash 64. And then we just specify serial 0 0 0 and then it's done. So then we do the same thing for the next network, the PC3 network, which is IP route 2001 colon db8 colon 1 colon 3 colon colon uh, 3. And in this case, the exit interface is going to be serial 001. And we hit enter and then routing should all be configured. So if everything works as it should, we should be able to send a ping from PC3 to PC1, right? And we can, as you see. So what I did now was that I used the built-in send simple PDU function with impact tracer. So I can pick the little envelope here. I pick the source and the destination. And then I can see down here if the ping was successful or not. So this is just a very convenient way of sending ping packages within, uh, within Packet Tracer. And now we verified connectivity. So you can see that I didn't follow the instruction. That's something for you to do. Uh, and you should also go do the configure IPv4 static routes. Uh, but for now, let's get back to the theory. So, um, what we're going to do is just review how routing decisions happen. So this is something that I want you to, uh, want to show you. I want, we had this picture in the last lecture, but I think that it's a little bit more meaningful now. So just remember that the routing decision process, whenever a route uh, or whenever a package ends up on a, uh, on a router is that the router will search its routing table. You see the routing table that we could display here doing a and do show, uh, yeah, it's right here, show IP route. This is what it's examining. So first it's going to see if the package that it receives matches any directly connected route. Those are those denoted with a C. So let's go back to, this, to, to the theory. Uh, and if it does, it's going to check the ARP cache to see if it, if it knows the MAC address of the recipient. And if not, it's going to forward it uh, to do an, an ARP request and then forward to the host on the local subnet. If the destination IP address matches a remote network, then it's going to encapsulate the frame again and forward it out the exit interface of the next up router. 
And if there isn't any remote network, then it's going to see if there is a gateway of last resort. If there is, it's going to send it towards the gateway of last resort and otherwise it's going to discard a package. So let's look a little bit on troubleshooting. So common errors with regards to static routers, that would include failing interfaces. When, uh, I mean, when interfaces are maybe not enabled using the no shutdown command, when there is an IP configuration error, maybe the interfaces are on different subnets or whatever. Another reason is exhausted links when there is just too much traffic on the link. I would say that that isn't too common in modern networks, but in legacy networks, it's a real problem. Or just misconfiguration. Maybe your mind wasn't really there when you configured the static routes and then they are not going to, to work. And something to really remember here is that when you configure static routes, they are going to stay there in the router even if they're wrong. And since the routers are all going to have the same, uh, since the routes are all going to have the same metric, it means that the router will load balance over all matching static routes. So if you first do a a wrongful configuration of a static route to a network and then you do the correct one then the router is still going to lo load balance over those two even if the, if one of them doesn't work meaning that all packages will not reach the destination so whenever you misconfigure a static route you have to uh, remove it using the negation of the command meaning putting a no in front um, so and you should always uh, verify the static routes uh, by examining running config by show running config and or the routing table uh, doing a show IP route. So there are some more nice troubleshooting commands ping of course which is a connectivity test or within packet tracer you can do the send simple PDU. Uh, you can also do the trace route command and it is sort of similar to ping but what it does is that it reports every hop from sort, source to destination. So you, the output you will get will, will be, well, if I want to go from network A to B, first I go through this router, then I go through that router, and then I'm there. So you can really see what way it's taking. Uh, if you're on a router, you can do a show, not shout, show IP route to display the routing table or show IP interface brief and that is going to display the status um, of the interfaces. So I'm just going to go back to, to our packet tracer assignment here and show you some things. So first I want to show you some, uh, I want to do some show commands. So I want to begin on router one uh, and I want to just to show, do show IP interface brief and I have to put a do in front. Uh, this is a very nice piece of, uh, of output. Okay, so it should be show IPv6 because we're doing IPv6. So show IPv6 inter interface brief. And what it will show us is very compact information saying that gigabit ethernet 00, zero it's up up. And up up means that the status is up, meaning that it's connected, and the protocol is up, meaning that it is uh, enabled using the no shutdown command. So if I'm going into um, interface gigabit ethernet zero zero and I do a shutdown, so it's as it was by default, and then I do show IPv6 interface brief again, you will see that now it's administratively down and then it's also down. Um, so more than that, you can see the IPv6 addresses or the IP addresses. In this case, when we do IPv6, we commonly have a link local FE80 address and we have a global unicast address. So that's a very nice command, show IP interface brief. Also show running config. So do show running config and we can see the actual configuration. Show running config is actually my favorite way of troubleshooting. That's where I always begin. Uh, however, I know that Cisco has a troubleshooting process that you should be aware of for, for the practical. Uh, or for the theor theoretical quizzes, but running config is always a nice place to go. So now I also want to show you, see here that we have a route, this is the running config, so it's saved in uh, the RAM, and it's going to be uh, it's going to be removed or lost when we when we reboot the router, and what's going to be loaded is the startup config. So if I, we just look at the startup config, so do show start, then you can see that the route that we created it's not here. So what we have to do whenever we do configuration is that we have to save our running config to startup config and we can do that in one of two ways. Either we do a do uh, copy running config or run startup config or just start 
and then destination file name yes enter and then we're good and now if we uh, go do show start you can see that our route will be in the startup config another way that you can do it is by just go do write mem and that's the same thing without the prompt to uh, to ask but but do copy running start running config to start config that's the cisco way of doing it so that may that's maybe what you should be mostly aware about so that's it for lesson two of cc uh, lesson two of ccna to writing and switching essentials with me, Joachim Shevrestad. Uh, when we get back to next class, which will be chapter three, of course, then we're going to look at uh, dynamic routing at a, at a glance. So how can we uh, specify routes in a dynamic manner or make the routers learn about them automatically? So if you're enjoying the classes, uh, make sure that you check in for the next lesson as well, or go to www.his.se and see what courses the University of Kota has to offer for you. And maybe I'll see you physically in a class in the future. So thank you for this and see you in the next lesson.